Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Um, my name is Andrew Mooney, and I have just finished my PhD at Trinity College Dublin, um, but I was also working with Species 360 at the same time. And today I'm going to showcase some of the research that I've been involved in over the last four years on the value of ex situ collections for biodiversity conservation, and particularly the importance of globally shared data in conservation research. So it really shouldn't come as a surprise to any of you that global biodiversity is facing unprecedented pressures, uh, poaching, pollution, habitat loss and fragmentation, invasive species, global warming, and many other factors mean that our planet is facing a sixth mass extinction event. We just can't get away from that fact. In fact, if we look at the rate of extinction being observed today, it is up to a thousand times higher than the normal background rate of extinction. And this has shown no signs of slowing down and is actually increasing for almost every taxonomic group we've looked at. And this has resulted in the loss of many charismatic species this century alone, such as the Western black rhino and the Yangtze River dolphin. Now, traditionally, when we look at conservation, um, it's undertaken through the in situ approach, protecting wildlife within their natural habitat. Although this remains the gold standard of wildlife conservation, it alone is not enough to, get, to halt the continuing loss in biodiversity that we're observing. And as a result, there is increasing relevance and importance to the ex situ role being undertaken by the world's zoos and aquariums. The global zoo and aquarium community really does represent one of the most promising tools we have to combat species extinction and to preserve global biodiversity. They not only breed and maintain populations of thousands of species, but they also act as centers for public education, wildlife rehabilitation, scientific research, and public entertainment. We can't forget that. People go to zoos for a good time. Zoos and aquariums attract more than 700 million people every single year around the world. And this really is an unparalleled audience for conservation education. However, despite their best efforts, the ex situ community faces many problems and issues which can affect biodiversity conservation, both in situ and ex situ. And my work really has just been looking at some of these issues on a global scale using globally shared zoological records from Species 360. Now, I'm sure you're all aware, but Species 360 is a nonprofit records keeping organization which operates the real time online database ZIMS. It contains complete institutional holdings for more than 1,200 institutions globally, encompassing more than 21,000 species and 10 million individual animals, both living and historic. And this spans demographic, husbandry, and veterinary records. So for each of animal in each of these around 1,200 zoos, we know a lot about them. We know where they were born, who its parents were, did it move, how many offspring did it have, even how much did it weigh? Was it on contraception? All of these things can be included in ZIMS. So therefore, it has huge potential to answer really important questions related to the ex situ conservation and management of thousands of species. And one of these issues um, relates to how zoos and aquariums decide which species to include in their collections and the roles that these species, such as large charismatic vertebrates like rhinos, play in biodiversity conservation, both within zoos and also in the wild. For example, although I have said all the amazing work zoos can do, unfortunately, zoos are also limited, particularly by the space available to them. Zoos have a limited footprint that they can operate with. And this means that the inclusion of one species in a collection occurs at the exclusion of at least one other. So it's pretty important, as if you look at zoo collections today, they're extremely taxonomically biased towards large charismatic vertebrates, which by their very nature occupy huge amounts of space in the zoo. If the goal of a modern zoo is just to conserve maximal biodiversity, then zoos should really trade out these larger species for numerous smaller bodied species. For example, the room needed to house a herd of Asian elephants in a European zoo could be used to house hundreds of smaller bodied species of amphibians and vertebrates or fish, which are also endangered. And such changes in collection composition have been advocated for. And if you've, unless you've been sitting under a rock, you know that this issue has kind of been more political lately too, with increased societal discomfort at having certain large charismatic animals in captivity, such as uh, cetaceans, elephants, primates, and large cats. And of course, this kind of complicates the issue a little bit more. Now, 
On the other side of all of this, zoos worry that a loss of these large charismatic vertebrates and a shift towards all of these smaller species would reduce visitor attendance by reducing visitor satisfaction. People go to a zoo and they expect to see elephants and tigers. Now, this in turn could actually have a knock-on effect on conservation in the wild, as today's zoos and aquariums invest more than $350 million annually in in-situ conservation. And they currently act as the third largest conservation organization contributor globally when you look at the resources collectively. Now, this map here shows the global reach of the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle in terms of its in-situ work. And as you can see, its conservation activities extend far beyond its own walls. And this kind of map can be reproduced for almost every accredited zoo and aquarium. And the worry then is that if we remove these large charismatic animals from zoos, we reduce visitor attendance, which in turn would reduce this global in situ conservation investment, ultimately then exacerbating the decline in biodiversity and habitat loss rather than trying to prevent it, which is what we're ultimately trying to do as a zoo and aquarium community. So using globally shared ZIMS data, we aim to understand whether the presence of these large vertebrates in zoos is helping to drive visitor attendance and therefore revenue. And if by doing so, then the contribution of zoos and aquariums to conservation projects in the wild. If by housing large vertebrates in zoos, we can not only breed and maintain that individual species, but also maintain entire habitats and ecosystems, then their presence at the expense of other smaller bodied species may represent an optimal conservation strategy. Now, visitor attendance is not an easy phenomenon to try and explain, especially by something as simple as just the body mass of the animals in a zoo. So we here took a system-wide approach and implemented a structural equation modeling or SEM framework to try and find out what exactly was influencing visitor attendance. So structural equation modeling has the benefit of looking at both direct and indirect pathways between numerous variables all at the same time to provide a broader picture of the system that you're trying to look at. Importantly though, SEM does require a very strong background knowledge of the system in order to guide this model structure. So based on an in-depth literature search and proposed hypotheses, we took various institution level metrics in addition to sociodemographic factors, looking at both direct and indirect relationships to see how they're related to visitor attendance. And then we try to relate these again, directly and indirectly to the in situ contributions of zoos and aquariums. So for each zoo, we took very basic metrics like the number of species in the zoo, the number of animals in the zoo, different diversity and taxonomic indices, and of course the size of the zoo, all of which could be obtained from Species 360 or the IOCN Red List. For body mass, we took a mean species level body mass for each zoo, and this data was obtained from DISCO, which is a species level index standardizing demographic data across 22 other databases, such as ANAGE and the Amniote Life History Database. We also looked at GDP and national population size and then local population size around zoos um, in 10 and 50 kilometer radii. And we got this data from NASA's gridded population count and the World Bank. And then we use structural equation modeling to see how all of these potential variables influenced visitor attendance, which was provided by the International Zoo Yearbook. Now, in order to look at the in situ contributions bit, uh, we had to use the number of in situ projects in which individual AZA member institutions were investing in annually. And then we tried to bring all of these together using structural equation modeling to see what the actual relationships were like. And we tested this framework against our sample size of 458 zoos spanning 58 countries around the world. So it really was quite a big sample size that we were able to work with because of all the data in zooms. So the number of animals present in a zoo and their body mass had the greatest relative effect on visitor attendance with smaller effects from things like mammal species richness. Um, but one of the biggest factors we found really was the local population size around the zoo. If you were near a city, you often had many more visitors, which kind of makes sense. Um, however, we also can see some indirect relationships here between these variables. If you have a bigger body mass, you have fewer species and fewer animals in your zoo, which makes total sense. You can't have loads of elephants. Um, and also, there's even more indirect relationships. If you have bigger animals in your zoo, your collection is much more similar often to other zoos. So if you have big animals, you're very similar to all the other zoos around you. 
And then looking at the in-situ bit, the biggest predictor of in-situ contributions was visitor attendance with smaller effects from the size of the zoo and the number of threatened species in the zoo. And this is quite a complex diagram and you kind of have to sit down and look at all the relationships individually to get a better kind of grasp of what's happening. But if we just simplify it down to look at the strongest predictors of both attendance and in situ contributions, we can see that if we want to maximize this in situ investment, we should really maximize our visitor numbers. And the best way to do that seems to be to have lots of large animals and hopefully be situated near a lot of people. And although this is kind of intuitive and we know this, this is the first time anyone's been able to show this on any kind of large scale. Um, and it kind of provides some credence to the idea that we can use these large charismatic animals as flagship species to generate conservation funding. And although it is completely what we would expect to find, it's also kind of contradictory. Um, if we look at these indirect relationships, we see that having lots of animals and lots of unique animals is good for visitor attendance. But the moment we start to increase the body mass of our zoo to increase attendance, total animals and the uniqueness of your collection start to decrease. So in this case, there's a very clear trade-off within the system of which one you want to maximize. Do you want big animals or do you want lots of unique smaller animals? So instead of finding this kind of nice relationship, what we actually find is that it looks kind of like this. Ultimately, zoos have multiple demands influencing their collection composition, and they have multiple goals outside of pure conservation, all of which have to be considered and incorporated into the collection planning process. However, this work does suggest that these large charismatic animals can play a very important indirect conservation role by generating funding for conservation activities in the wild, and that the removal from zoos should kind of be cautioned as it could potentially reduce the in situ contributions from zoos, ex exacerbating the current rate of biodiversity loss. Um, that's, that was kind of a, a whirlwind tour of a very complex model, but if you do want to know more about the project, um, it was published open access last year in Nature Communications, so please feel free to check it out and get in contact if you have any questions. Um, but of course, everything that I've talked about really does rely on the fact that zoos and aquariums need to be able to maintain genetically and demographically sustainable populations. However, there is a huge wealth of evidence now that showing that ex situ populations for the majority of managed species at least are currently facing a sustainability crisis and flamingos are a really good example of this. So flamingos or the Phenicopteridae consist of six living species, including the greater Chilean, lesser American, Kuna and Andean flamingos, all of which are found in zoos today. In fact, flamingos are the most popular and represented species of bird in zoos, with at least one of these six species being found in two thirds of all zoos. However, the Puna and the Andean flamingo are found in very, very small population sizes and are not really considered a priority for future ex situ management. So we're not going to really be focusing on these two species here. Now, despite these very large population sizes and their popularity, ex situ flamingo populations are still considered unsustainable due to poor rates of reproductive success. And they're still therefore considered reliant on the periodic importation of wild caught animals, which is in itself an unsustainable practice for zoos. Now in a bid to promote population sustainability, IAZA, AZA and WWT Slimbridge created the Flamingo Best Management Practice Guidelines. And these guidelines try to summarize what determines flamingo reproductive output in captivity, such as a balanced sex ratio, the wing condition of the birds, so if they're pinioned or if they're full winged, climate and particularly rainfall and temperature, the moving of birds between zoos seems to influence reproduction and most importantly flock size and um, where larger flocks are needed for successful reproduction. Flock size really is the most important thing that seems to determine flamingo reproductive success and this has become the central tenant of flamingo management resulting in what's known today as the 2040 rule where 20 birds are seen as necessary for welfare purposes and 40 birds are seen as necessary for reliable reproduction to occur. Now, some institutions have gone to some extreme lengths to try and artificially increase flock sizes using things like mirrors and speakers, um, but so far there's no real evidence that that's kind of working. So we really do need at least 40 individual birds in an enclosure um, for reliable reproduction. Now, although these recommendations are based on the best evidence to date, they are derived from a very limited number of studies, often looking at a single species, a single flock in a single zoo. 
yet the results are now being applied to flock management of all flamingo species globally, meaning that we're likely missing key species specific differences in reproductive behavior and the influence and interactions of things like climate and sex ratio on reproductive success. And this is kind of where the globally shared records of Species 360 can play an important role by allowing us to identify trends in reproduction over time and then how they relate to things like flock size, sex ratio, and climate. So using data from nearly 500 Species 360 member institutions, we looked at data from 1990 to 2019 for four flamingo species, the American, Crater, Chilean, and the Lesser. And we asked the question, what flock size do we actually need for each flamingo species to increase reproduction? We also looked at the sex ratio of the flock, the proportion of new individuals in a flock, which had been brought into the flock from another institution the previous year. And then we looked at both rainfall and temperature. And in these cases, it was the mean annual precipitation and temperature value we were looking at. And then we use generalized linear mixed effects modeling to see what the probability was that a flock would reproduce, giving all of these individual parameters per collection. So using Zim's data, we can see that for Chilean flamingos, um, around 100 birds is the best flock size for reproduction, giving around a 90% chance that the flock will reproduce. We can see that the recommended flock size of 40 birds will only give us around a 30% chance of a successful reproduction occurring in that flock. So clearly we need much larger Chilean flamingo flocks than we are currently recommending. We also found evidence that a balanced sex ratio um, in a flock was quite important for reproduction and we'll come back to this in a minute. Um, but we also then found that low rainfall and low temperature variation seem to promote reproduction. So in this case, we, we want kind of hot and um, constant environments with low, with low rainfall. Um, which can be a bit of a problem if you're in Western Europe. Now, if you look at the American flamingo, we can see that once again, we need flocks of around 100 birds for reliable reproduction, with a recommended flock size of 40 birds, giving us only around 40% chance of successful reproduction. Now, for the American flamingo, we also found evidence that adding new individuals into a flock has a big reproductive benefit beyond the benefit we get from just increasing the flock size. So this is an extra reproductive benefit of adding new birds, something which we can potentially use to try and mitigate the effects of smaller flock sizes moving forward. In addition, again, low rainfall seems to promote reproduction, mirroring the natural history of flamingos. And this is again, similar for the greater flamingo. We once again, ideally would like a flock size of around 100 birds for optimal reproduction and with a flock size of 40 birds, giving us around a 20% chance here of reproduction occurring. And once again, we found evidence that a balanced sex ratio was very important for this species. Um, but what does that mean? Well, ultimately, we see the highest probability of reproduction um, at roughly an even sex ratio. Um, and this is kind of a problem as around a third of all flamingos in zoos and aquariums are currently unsexed. So if we need to ma manage the sex ratio of a flock, the first thing we need to do is actually know what the sex ratio of the flock is to begin with. So some very simple work that can be done to really help try and increase reproductive uh, output in flocks. And um, so ultimately, ultimately here, if we have biased flocks um, that aren't reproducing, we might have a potential way to mitigate that moving forward. Now we found no effect of temperature or rainfall on the greater flamingo, um, unlike the previous two. And lastly, for lesser flamingos, we see that you need a flock size of around 150 birds here for reliable reproduction to occur. If you have the 40 birds, like the guideline suggests, then you have an almost 0% chance of that flock reproducing. And even compared to the other three species, a flock size of 100 birds here will only give a roughly 50% chance of that flock reproducing. So this previously unknown relationship is particularly important for lesser flamingos as they have historically shown the lowest rates of reproductive success of the four studied species. And this might help to try and explain why. And once again, we also see that a balanced sex ratio is an important factor for this species, but we found no significant effect of rainfall or temperature again. So in summary, we really do suggest that all institutions increase their flock sizes as much as possible to reach this approximately 100 bird optimum and more obviously for lesser flamingos. We also encourage institutions to make sure their flocks consist of an even sex ratio, 
and to move birds around if they have to until they can reach this even sex ratio. We also suggest that um, institutions should periodically move individuals between them as we saw a very clear extra reproductive benefit of adding individuals into an existing flock in addition to the benefit of increasing the flock size overall. Now globally shared data has helped us to unravel these relationships but there's still a lot more work to be done. Um, although we were able to include things like rainfall and temperature, we found that low rainfall and high temperature were important. There are lots of other factors that we couldn't really account for here. And that they include things like diet, um, enclosure design, wind condition, and loads of other potential um, variables. But at least this does give us a solid base on which we can start to manage each flamingo species individually moving forward to try and make sure their populations become sustainable. And there's no reason similar analyses cannot be done for other populations in zoos and aquariums using all of this globally shared data. Now, with the increasing realization that zoos and aquariums just aren't able to maintain genetically and demographically sustainable populations, there is increasing relevance and importance to the emerging role of zoos and aquariums to contribute to the preservation of genetic variation in biobanks, helping to ensure population sustainability and persistence. And this is a project I was looking up to work with the San Diego Zoo on. And um, of course, they have the big frozen zoo collection in San Diego. Um, and here I was looking at prioritizing species for biobanking efforts at the San Diego Zoo frozen zoo. So biobanking really, it's just the storage of genetic material, um, including gametes, blood samples, uh, living somatic cell cultures, which is what I'm going to talk about here. Um, but then also like tissue samples, hair samples, all of these things can be considered biobanking. Um, but the ultimate goal then is to use these to aid in species conservation when needed, using advanced reproductive technologies, increasing genetic diversity, and then promoting population viability. Now, living somatic cell cultures in particular are not the same as freezing a tissue sample. If you just freeze a tissue sample um, and defrost it, it's dead. Um, but living somatic cell cultures, they're generated from tissue samples, but unlike tissue samples, when we defrost living somatic cell cultures, they remain viable and can continue to multiply and then be refrozen. So really they are an expendable resource that can remain in a state of suspended animation almost indefinitely. And um, they are much more expensive to create obviously than just freezing a tissue sample. Uh, but the fact that these cells remain alive is a huge benefit for conservation. Now, just to show you the power of biobanking, this is the Pyrenean ibex. And in 2000, it became extinct due to hunting and agriculture. Now, prior to this, the last living individual was briefly captured and a small living cell sample was taken and cryogenically stored. Now, using this cell sample, scientists were able to clone the animal in 2003. Um, and in that year, the Pyrenean ibex became the first animal in history to be resurrected from extinction representing a huge leap forward in conservation biology and obviously promised them for the future. Unfortunately, the animals survived only a few minutes and they haven't cloned it since. Um, but the fact that we can do this in practice uh, really is a hugely promising sign for biobanking moving forward. And obviously that's a very sensational example, but biobanking also has the potential to help recover other threatened wildlife, such as the black-footed ferret. Now, this species was almost wiped out entirely in the early 20th century due to agricultural development and rodent poisons. The species was thought to be extinct, but in 1981, a very small relics population was discovered in Wyoming, and 18 of these animals were caught up to try and establish a captive breeding colony, from which all wild blackfoot ferrets today are now actually descended. So several hundred blackfoot ferrets now survive in the wild due to a successful reintroduction program. However, low genetic diversity and inbreeding still remain a problem for this species. Now, biobanking really is a critical part of this project, as all 18 original individuals were sampled. And even those that didn't reproduce and are not represented in the living population today have living cell samples in the San Diego Zoo frozen zoo. And in December 2020, using these stored samples, the first successful clone of a black-footed ferret, a female named Elizabeth Ann, was born. Now, Elizabeth Ann is the clone of another ferret uh, named Willa, who lived more than 30 years ago. Now, Willa's genome uh, possessed three times more unique variations than the living population today, 
Therefore, if Elizabeth Ann successfully mates and reproduces, she could provide unique genetic diversity to the species, helping to restore population health and sustainability. And all of this is possible just because of some cells in a freezer. So there, there's huge potential here. Um, and obviously it's expensive, but the fact that we have these cells to begin with um, really is very promising. Now, the largest biobank in the world is housed at the San Diego Zoo's Institute for Conservation Research and is referred to as the Frozen Zoo. It was founded in 1975 by Dr. Kurt Wynerschke, and today it houses around 10,000 living cell samples, representing around 1,000 taxa. Now, this sounds really impressive, and it is, um, but although there are extremely rare samples in the Frozen Zoo, such as the giant panda, northern white rhino, and even the extinct Pua'uli, um, a bird native to Hawaii, the way in which we have selected samples to date has been opportunistic, and it's been, <clears throat> it's been lacking any kind of comprehensive plan or goal. And as a result, we are likely missing key opportunities to collect samples from species which are on the brink of extinction or have already gone extinct. And it's just because we haven't been prioritizing species that we don't even know what we're missing. So here we aimed to investigate the representation of amphibians, birds, mammals, and reptiles within the San Diego Zoo Frozen Zoo uh, living cell collection. And then their potential conservation value by looking at how close they were with other global conservation prioritization schemes. So we compared all the species in San Diego Zoo's Frozen Zoo with IUCN Red List, which of course categorizes species based on threat level. We also looked at species which were listed on the Alliance for Zero Extinction List. And these are species which are restricted to a single geographic location around the world. And so they really are very vulnerable if anything happens in that one place. We also looked at ZSL's edge scores. So these are species which are endangered, but they're also then considered evolutionarily distinct. So this is another potential value that you may have beyond just being endangered. We also looked at the species listed in CITES, which are threatened by global trade, and then the species which are considered climate change vulnerable. Um, and this is from a study by Fodden et al. in 2013. And so subsequently, once we had a good idea of what the frozen zoo's current collection looked like, we then implemented a kind of a qualitative framework to try and identify and prioritize species for future sampling efforts. Um, again, trying to focus on the IUCN threatened species, um, but then also considering their congruency with all these other global conservation prioritization schemes. And a very important part of this was then to look at where we could actually get samples from. And this is where the uh, records from ZIMS came in, um, while also looking then at AZA and the AZA population management programs. And the idea is here that if we have a lot of really rare species in zoos, they're often much easier to get samples from than species in the wild. So we need to identify these cost-effective opportunities to collect samples rather than wasting time and money trekking to the wild to, to collect these samples. So we found that the Frozen Zoo living cell collection is made up of 965 distinct species, including 511 mammals, 310 birds, 120 reptiles, and 24 amphibians. Now, although this does reflect taxonomic preferences and biases, uh, it also reflects the fact that amphibian and reptile cells are often much harder to culture um, than mammal and bird cells. So it's not just that we hate uh, amphibians and reptiles here. Now, although the majority of species um, in the frozen zoo are not considered threatened with extinction, um, 538 of them are considered least concerned under IUCN, the 311 species which are considered threatened within the frozen zoo, those represent 5.1% of all known threatened terrestrial vertebrates on the planet. 5.1% is a huge number here. Uh, and so it really is an immense resource for future conservation and research efforts. And all of this is in one single room in San Diego. It really is, they, they say in San Diego that it's meant to be the most biodiverse room on the planet. And when you look at these numbers, you can see why. Now, we also show that 2.3% of these Alliance for Zero Extinction species are sampled. 13.9% of the CITES species have been sampled. 2.5% of the climate change vulnerable species have been sampled. And 5.7% of the evolutionarily distinct, but also endangered species uh, have been sampled. 
Now, these may seem like really small numbers, um, but these species are often extremely rare and found in inaccessible locations. So these numbers really aren't that surprising and should be seen as an encouraging start, I guess. And remember, this is only one uh, biobank. There are lots of other biobanks around the world, um, which could help to fill in some of these gaps. Now, you're probably thinking it, um, but of course, each of these prioritization schemes have the potential to overlap with one another. And here we can see the overlap of the species that have already been sampled. And we find that one species is found under every single prioritization scheme and has already been sampled, and that it is the Sphinx macaw. This is a bird native to Brazil, which currently numbers less than 200 individuals, all of which are maintaining captivity today. Now, 311 species and 5.1% of globally threatened terrestrial vertebrate biodiversity is impressive. But now what? Where do we go from here? And how do we decide which species to add to this already impressive collection? Well, straight away, we can increase this from 5.1% to 16.5%, as there are currently an additional 695 unsampled threatened species in at least one Species 360 member zoo or aquarium. We don't have to trek to the wild to collect samples from these species. All we have to do is call up a zoo and get them to post us a tissue sample. But 695 species is an awful lot of samples to collect. For some context, it has taken nearly 50 years for the frozen zoo to collect samples from a thousand species. So clearly this initial list does need to be refined even further. And again, we can look at our prioritization schemes to identify species that are the most threatened and have the greatest potential conservation value. And when we look at the overlap between these schemes, we can see that there are three unsampled species which are included under every single prioritization scheme and are also found in at least one zoo or aquarium. And these are the whooping crane, crested ibis, and Siberian crane. And we believe these species represent very high priorities for future sample collection due to their clear conservation value and the relative ease of sample availability. However, any subset of these schemes can be used for species prioritization. Just like individual zoos, individual biobanks often have different criteria and different goals they're working towards. So if your biobank really doesn't care about international trade, you don't need to consider CITES. But it is one way of trying to measure the conservation value of these species. And one particularly important group that concerns zoos are the IUCN extinct in the wild species. Currently, 50% of the extinct in the wild um, terrestrial vertebrates have been sampled. But we can actually increase this to 92% as there are five more species represented within the Species 360 member institution network, which have yet to be sampled. And these include the black sawshell turtle, you can see spray toad and Lister's gecko. Now these species should be immediately sampled due to the fact that they're solely relying on continued ex situ management and breeding. If this ex situ population fails, these species will be extinct. Therefore, these do represent the highest possible priority species, in our opinion. And although the work of the frozen zoo to date is really impressive, the role of ex situ collections really is only going to become more important moving forward as stricter regulations on the transport of biological material and ethical issues around biological resource sovereignty prevent the collection of samples from the wild. Similarly, numerous other biobanks also exist, including the Kunming Cell Bank in China and the Tronga Zoo Biobank. However, each of these collections remain isolated, and we really do strongly encourage the formation of a global biobank database to prevent duplicate sampling and to ensure the coordination of future sampling initiatives. Uh, although the Species 360 and ZIMS um, sample storage module can help to do this, we need to start bringing in non-Species 360 members into this kind of database as well. And although this list is a good start, um, Further work really is needed to not only identify which species to collect, but also which individual animals should be sampled from the global zoo and aquarium community moving forward. For example, there are currently 206 Western lowland gorillas within the frozen zoo. However, the genetic diversity these 206 animals represent is not really known. And we believe collaboration with regional zoo association stud books is necessary to identify the most genetically valuable individuals to be sampled from in future, preventing wasting of resources. 
do we really need 200 gorillas or do we just need 20? And of those 20, which is the most genetically unique? Because that's the individual we should be looking to sample. So where does all of this leave ex situ conservation and collections moving forward then? As biodiversity is almost guaranteed to continue declining, the role of ex situ conservation and collections will only increase. Particularly, I believe further integration of in situ and ex situ activities are needed, as suggested by the IUCN's one plan approach. We need to start treating all populations of a species as a single meta population. And particularly when it comes to biobanking, we have an easy way to try and transfer genetic information from captive to wild populations, and also to use wild populations as sources for genetic variation for captive populations. So really, it all needs to be joined together. Similarly, you might have noticed that aquariums were not really discussed here at all. And this mirrors the lack of ex situ research on aquatic species overall. And I really do encourage further research and particularly sustainability analyses on such species moving forward. The majority of aquarium collections are still wild source, and this is not going to be possible for much longer. So if we don't start looking at this now, we're going to go to the stage where we don't have these huge, vast aquarium collections that we're used to. However, without the sharing of data in databases such as ZIMS, ex situ collections really are of limited value individually. And I really strongly encourage the continued sharing of data and the integration of ZIMS data with non-Species 360 members moving forward to ensure sustainable and effective ex situ conservation. If you look at Species 360 membership, it is extremely biased towards North America and Europe. So we are missing a huge geographic gap of zoon aquarium collections, which honestly, we just don't know what's in those collections. They could have extremely rare species that could be incorporated into existing population management programs. But we need to start looking at this on a global scale and not ignoring uh, these collections that we're just not familiar with at the minute. So with that, I just wanna say a huge thank you to my supervisors, my PhD, and particularly Yvonne Buckley at Trinity. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Trinity for funding all of the work I've just shown you. Um, Fulbright for funding my work with San Diego Zoo, and then both Irish Research Council and Species360 for helping cover costs throughout my PhD. Uh, if you want to contact me, my email is mooney 2 at tc.ie, and you can find me on Twitter uh, at andymooney13. And of course, I want to give a huge shout out to all of the amazing co-authors who have helped guide each of these projects, particularly the people at Species360, San Diego Zoo, and of course, um, by as his very own Paul Rose, who talked on Monday, and um, for all of his expert flamingo knowledge. And yeah, so with that, I just wanna say thank you for listening. And if you have any questions at all, please just let me know. Brilliant, thanks, Andrew, that was fantastic. Um, we've had a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll just read those out too, if that's all right. Um, so Lisa Riley says, uh, great talk, questions if that's okay. Uh, firstly, should a small number of zoos keep a large number of one type of large of one type of large animal and then another small number of zoos keep a different species of large animals and so on to maximize conservation slash engagement research, uh, reach? And two, for the flamingos, how did you calculate probability of reproduction? Oh, so I, I feel like I don't have an answer for the first one because our results are showing that ideally you want your collection to be as big animals as possible, but also as spread out from another zoo as possible, which goes directly in the face of all of the conservation and population management programs, which say we want everything to be as close as possible together and to increase efficacy. So I think some ways around that, and I, we see it for a few species, I think could be regional specialization on certain species. So like, for example, you don't really see pronghorn um, antelope in Europe, but you see it in North America. Um, or even like bison, if you focus on North American bison in North America, European bison in Europe, that could be one way of trying to get around this um, issue where you're still having some kind of regional specialization and uniqueness, but also then still trying to maintain these kind of large charismatic animals that seem to be driving visitor numbers. Um, in terms of flinger reproduction, uh, so what we did basically to calculate the probability of reproduction was for each flock in each zoo in each year, we looked at if they produced even a single chick. And if they produce a single chick, we just had that as a binary response variable, where it's either yes, no. And um, if they had a chick, they reproduced. 
And then we just ran that as a binary model against all of our different predictors. Now, I didn't show it here because it's a bit more complicated, but we had a second set of analyses then on the flocks that did reproduce. We ran the same model, but this time looking at the number of chicks as an output. So if you've had a chick, how many chick, how big, how big does your flock size need to be to get more chicks? Um, I hope that makes sense. Now, those, those results will obviously be in the paper, but it's a little bit confusing to try and present it somewhere like here. But ultimately, we see almost the exact same relationship where we're reaching this around 100 bird optimum. Um, and then we start to kind of trail off. Now, one thing that I should mention is that we're seeing this kind of trail off in reproduction at huge flock sizes. But this is likely as a result of direct management intervention to prevent breeding in these huge flocks. And Paul Rose has told me that sometimes zoos will literally go in and take the eggs away because they don't have room to house all of these birds. So really what we'd expect to see is probably much more of a linear relationship where the bigger the flock, the more birds um, we're producing. But for the minute, we're seeing this kind of ex situ effect of having a limit around 100 birds. And whether that's space or resources, um, it's kind of up to each individual zoo, but that's kind of an arse fact of using captive data on this. I hope that answers your questions. Perfect. Um, and then we've had another question from Hannah who just said, how did you overcome the high proportion of unsexed flamingos in your sex ratio slash reproductivity analysis? <laughs> That's a perfect question. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was a huge issue for us because obviously if you're trying to include the, the sex ratio and you have a third of it that's unknown, you can't really have a reliable sex ratio at that point. So in addition to the two sets of models on reproduction, we also ran each of those sets of models again, um, but this time we restricted it to just the flocks where we know at least 50% of the sex ratio. And for those flocks where we have the 50% of the sex ratio, um, we then took what that proportion was as the representative of um, that flock. So if we had, let's say 20% unsexed, 40% male, 40% female, for that we were just taking the sex ratio as 40% female because um, we couldn't distinguish beyond that. Now, it's still not ideal. Um, we'll definitely give you that, but it was the best way we could get around having such a large number on sex to just kind of restrict to this 50% cutoff point. So ultimately, we have all of these graphs and results, again, using a smaller subset for females, but we didn't combine all of that here. Um, yeah, great question, though. I, I hate if you were reviewing my paper. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, that's all the questions we've had come in. But um, I think just like to say on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for giving up your time. Really interesting talk. Uh, I think we can all agree. Uh, as I said, I will make the recording available hopefully next week or the week after. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, Andrew, for your time. And thanks, everybody else for coming. Thanks, guys. <laughs>